So today it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Thomas More. I know that many of you are acquainted with Thomas through his wonderful books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Care of the Soul, a guide for cultivating depth and sacredness in everyday life. That was published in 1992. Thomas has written, I think over 30 books now, about bringing soul to personal life and culture, deepening spirituality, humanizing medicine, finding meaningful work, imagining sexuality with soul, and doing religion in a fresh way. In his youth, he was a Catholic monk and studied music composition. He has a PhD in religious studies from Syracuse University and was a university professor for a number of years. He is also a psychotherapist in, influenced mainly by Carl Jung and James Hillman. In his work, he brings together spirituality, mythology, depth psychology, and the arts, emphasizing the importance of images and imagination. He often travels and lectures, hoping to help create a more soul, soulful society. Thomas also writes fiction. He has a background in music composition and plays the piano daily as a kind of meditation. So Thomas, it's a joy to have you with us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking me, Patrick. <laughs> I would be out playing golf otherwise. <laughs> okay, and I believe you wrote a book about golf. I also. wrote a book of stories about golf. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, the worst, I'm the world's worst player, but the most, uh, you know, I enjoy it. Well, hey, if you can participate and enjoy it, why not? <laughs> and it's also a great way to be out in, out in nature, too. That's right. And um, so I think we'll start off. This will be a, a sort of a, a conversation. I'll start it off. And uh, anybody who's here, if you want to set, put a message um, I'll watch the chat coming in, and if you have questions that you, you know, as you go along, if something comes up and you want to ask Thomas a question, I could sort of pick it up from the chat. How does that, how does all that sound, Thomas? Sounds perfect. Okay. <laughs> so perhaps we could um, uh, start off um, in, the, in the introduction to care of the soul. You described loss of soul as the great malady of the 20th century, implicated in all of our troubles and affecting us individually and socially. You say that when soul is neglected, it, just, it doesn't just go away. It appears symptomatically in obsessions, addictions, violence, and loss of meaning. All symptoms that of course send patients to therapists and of course to 12-step programs. And it's interesting, you know, I see parallels, you know, in what you say and in what Bill Wilson says in the big book where he describes um, alcoholism as a spiritual malady causing loss of connection and meaning. I wonder if we could start off with the question, a sort of definition of, of soul, your definition of soul. Okay, it's um, that's starting from the most difficult place of all because it's very hard to define. But I can say this about it, that the soul is something like the essence of who we are. It's, it's beyond our emotions. It's beyond the mechanics of our daily lives. It's deep, deep down. We encounter it, it, we encounter it in our dreams with those images and those narratives that that we find ourselves in at night, it's such a mysterious place. But the soul itself is quite mysterious. And I think the best way to relate to it is to honor its mystery instead of trying to explain it or control it. Wonderful. I, that's a great, a great way to start us off here. We talk a lot about spirituality in, in our 12-step rooms, of course, it is a spiritual program based on um, spirituality. And uh, you, you talk about a, a sort of, you differentiate between soul and spirit. I wonder if you could talk about that a little. Sure. 
Um, it's, it seems, I mean, I, I agree with those people, philosophers who have said for centuries that a human being can be seen to be partly spiritual, partly of the soul, and partly physical body. Uh, those three things. And they're all equally important and they work together. Uh, so I have been, it's pretty obvious in my life, I've spent a lot of focus, uh, put a lot of focus on the spirit. I mean, I lived as a monk for 13 years and did all those things that monks do, a lot of praying and a lot of meditating and ritual and, and uh, study. And all of that is very spiritual and so very, very important to me. But somewhere along the line, I think it was my encounter with Jung. And uh, yeah, I think it was my encounter with Jung and Hillman and some other people who were working on the soul that moved me in that direction. And I felt I should devote my life to that because I felt that th that the spirit has been pretty well represented, but not the soul. And the difference is that the spirit is that great thing in us that aims us, focuses us beyond ourselves and always reaching into a better future and uh, seeing the world in very large, big ways and not being stuck in the practical, really, really transcending everything that we are in our normal lives. All of that is very valuable. And you even can see it in NASA sending rockets off to other planets today and the great telescope in the sky teaching us so many things about our universe. So that's all very spirit directed. You know, it's way beyond us, very valuable, but very high. The trouble is it also, like everything else, has a, has a dark side to it and can hurt us at the same time. Uh, I can tell you an example for me would be, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family that was very devout in their religion. I mean, very much so, my mother especially. And um, I never heard the word sex, I think, until I was about 25. You know, it was like, it wasn't allowed. Everyone would be embarrassed if we used the word. So, there are some disadvantages, you know, that could kind of hurt your sexuality if you grow up in an environment like that. Or I was also told that if I wasn't a good person, really a perfect person, I'd be in hell. And they described hell to me with great glee, you know, how these flames would surround me and burn me. And I, I was about five, six years old hearing these things. They stick to you when you hear them when you're that age. So. I'm saying that there are many ways, I'm just giving a couple of personal ways, in which spirit can also be harmful and can really hurt you, leave wounds. The soul is something kind of the opposite in many ways. The soul is very, very deep inside you, very deep. Uh, you you've sense it in your deepest emotions and in memory, in the memories that uh, you have. Like I just told you a memory of my childhood, that's deep in me. And just telling you that, it kind of stirs me, you know, just to say it. So that's the soul. My soul is stirring when I say that. Very deep down, very personal, it has to do with my family, my personal life. And uh, the soul has a lot to do with home. So when people have asked me how to care for my soul, I say the first thing, very first thing to do, is try to make a really good home for yourself, wherever you are, first of all. You know, get a house that you want to live in, live in a part of the world you want to live in, um, have the things around you that will make you feel good. Um, try to have some, connect with your neighbors, that helps your home. Uh, so many ways we can do that. You see, that's kind of a base for yourself, deep down. It's not way out there in the heavens, you know, it's very down where you live. And I would say that food is very important for the soul. Um, that's why when I find people who are having trouble in life, I suggest that they learn how to cook, take some cooking lessons to get into that. You know, cooking is full of metaphors. Like uh, It's like an alchemical process where you 
you make all these things on a stove. And what's happening there in metaphor is getting yourself together, you know, and cooking yourself, and, uh, getting some flavor out of your own life. So um, soul then can be very, very close to home and uh, deep down, and it too can be troubled. You know, we can have a lot of troubles in our soul. So if you grow up in a family that is doesn't know how to deal with children very well, those wounds of your childhood stay with you as, as images and stories, and, and they never go away. You know, they're there all the time, and they, they're present, and they affect you. And yet, a lot of times, they're invisible because we don't put our attention to them. So as someone myself who is a psychotherapist, the word psychotherapy means literally care of the soul. I'm someone who cares for souls. What I do is try to help people get closer to their childhood memories and notice how they are present and notice how they could if they want. They can choose a different kind of direction to go. They don't have to live those memories over and over again. So um, that's, that's just a start to tell you how I see soul and spirit as being two different directions in a life. Wonderful. And, and as you describe it, soul has this beautiful, gentle, deep quality, but it also has what we call the dark night of the soul. And I think um, with many of us in the 12 step rooms, uh, we spend a lot of time, especially people come in. We, we have alcohol is mentioned in the first step only, and it's only mentioned once, but God is mentioned many times throughout the rest of the steps or alluded to throughout the steps. And of course, there's talk of the necessity of a vital spiritual experience in order to achieve sobriety. One of the things that um, comes up a lot, you know, people come to, to our rooms um, in all sorts of conditions. We don't necessarily show up at a 12-step room, an A meeting, NA, or any of the 12-step rooms on a winning streak, you know. There's been, there's been, uh, maybe a lot of damage, some of it even spiritual abuse. Uh, there's a chat question there that uh, regarding that. But I wonder if you could talk, you know, because I, I have, I grew up similarly to you in Ireland, in rural Ireland, very devout Catholic uh, family, especially my mother, interestingly. I mean, we had the rosary every night. <laughs> and uh, my catechism, I remember from my catechism, it says, Man's soul is immortal, that is, it can never die. <laughs> so I still even remember my catechism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I got away from it all at a certain point, like so many of us do. And then we spend a lot of time explaining to people in AA when they come in, well, if you don't have a belief in God, that's fine. It's called a, a, a power greater than yourself. And I wonder if you could talk just about the use of the word God. Um, because it's something I grapple with sometimes. I, 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 I mean, in AA, it's, it's really not about belief, it's about behavior. We are, so so um, I wonder if we could tell me your, your thoughts on, on some of that, the use of the word God. Sure, I, I go on and on on that. That's one of my favorite <laughs> topics. Um, yes, I, I give a lecture where I say, the title of it is, I rarely speak of God or I rarely use the name God. That's true, I very rarely do. I do it, but very, very rarely. I mean, like once every five years, you know, I'm talking. So um, I do that because uh, I started out, uh, I, I just said, uh, kind of a child Catholicism. I, you know, it's so interesting, Patrick, what you say that you remember that phrase from your catechism, because that's an indication that we do hold, we still have those words being recited in us. You know, they don't go away. And you remember, they may be surprised to remember, but it's a hint that you probably have a lot of those things being repeated in you constantly that you don't hear, you're not aware of, but they're going on anyway. One thing we've learned from people like Carl Jung and others is that 
we have a, a life in us that's unconscious, that we're not aware of, but does affect us. And so that's why I think the, the, our child ideas about religion and about God are, are okay in a way, but on the other hand, they are childish. They're of a child. And I think that's very important for us to be adult about religion, to be adult. And I've studied, I was very interested in this question. So I got a PhD in religious studies. You know, I really studied it pretty intensely. And I felt after all my studies and, and experience, life experience, especially as a therapist, that the word God is, as I see it, is primarily there to put us on the edge at the very frontier of our existence, of our world. And we don't know really what's on the other side of that. Even our telescope doesn't tell us that, you know, really what it's all about. Uh, and I think that the, the word God should, in my view, should put us in that place where we don't know. And you know, this is not just my idea. The Tao Te Ching from China says, he who knows does not speak and he who speaks does not know. And uh, Meister Eckhart, this great mystic in the Christian tradition, uh, said that, uh, you know, that we don't know who God is. We don't know. We're in ignorance. Some of the great mystics have said that. Uh, Nicholas of Cusa was a great theologian who in the 14th, 15th century said, um, he wrote a book called Sacred Ignorance meaning how important it is that we are ignorant of certain things that we don't know. So we can use the word God if you want, but it's a dangerous word to use because it gives the impression that you've got a hold of something that's not holdable, that, that is infinite and unknowable, as Thomas Aquinas said, unknowable. I take that seriously. I think a lot of people don't. So I don't use the word God because I think it's not appropriate. And yet at the same time, and now I'm, I, I can tell you, I'm thinking like the great German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died because he was involved in a plot against Hitler. He wrote, he wrote a book, or he wrote really pages from prison before he was hanged. And in there he says that he lives before, he lives without God in the presence of God. And that's, to me, the answer. That's the best answer I've seen. It's a paradox that, that uh, we can be spiritual. And if you want to use the word God, you can. I don't. You can use it if you want to name or give, give you, bring you close to that great mystery that is unknown and unknowable. If it does that, we're in good shape. If it gives you too firm an idea of it, or you think you have the truth there, then I think you're in trouble because that's what causes so much conflict between people. They think they know the unknowable. So uh, in all my work, I try to evoke the presence of God without using the name God. Wonderful. No, that, that, that's a beautiful, you know, that, that'll help a lot of people because there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, when I came into the program, of course, I had background of not really paying much attention to people who talked about God. <laughs> uh, so that helped. And then, so I just, I was desperate. And so I looked at the people who were not drinking and I'm trying to figure out, well, what did they do? So I was willing to stay because out of desperation. And one of the acronyms actually we use in the 12 step rooms is uh, for people coming in in that state is G-O-D, gift of desperation. Yeah. And then we get the other G-O-D, good orderly direction from the G-O-D group of drunks. <laughs> so we use acronyms, you know, which, which make a lot of sense. And um, yes, yeah, so th I think that that's very, very helpful. That's really helpful, Thomas, thank you. And um, another thing in our email exchange, you mentioned that you've been longer, long interested in the deeper meaning of alcohol as an yeah. alchemical substance and its re 
relation to the Greek god Dionysus and uh, Jesus' miracle of uh, turning water into wine and saying that his blood is now wine. And um, I mean, I'm wondering if these two were our uh, first enablers. <laughs> Could be. Um, do, you want me to, do you want me to say something about those? It's fascinating to know, you know, uh, your, your thoughts on the alchemicals. You know, we talk about, you know, Jung talked about it. There was a fellow by the name of Roland Hazard, who was a wealthy American businessman who went, he was trying to stop drinking in a group called the Oxford Group. And um, he went and spent almost a year with Carl Jung in Switzerland in the early 30s. And um, Jung finally told him that the only solution that he could see for his drinking uh, would be to have a, a vital spiritual experience. He said it's the only time when he'd seen it happen. He gave him some ideas that Roland brought back to, back to America. And uh, he finally you know, met up with another gentleman, Ebby Thatcher, who finally met up with Bill Wilson. So they kind of serendipitously brought this, this uh, news from Carl Jung, this need for a vital spiritual experience, which they already been kind of working with in, in a group called the Oxford Groups. And so Jung, somehow he had a, an influence on the founding of, uh, on some of the thought in the founding of AA and Bill Wilson, and he had a, a, an exchange of letters. And Jung talked about this thing, this, this, this phrase, spiritas contra spiritum, where, you know, we come to the, the spirits, the small s, <laughs> that, that uh, 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 can only be, be opposed by the large spirit s, you know, the large s spirit, spiritas contra spiritum. But this is all interesting stuff. I know that you've mm -hmm. probably got some things to say about all of that, especially this thing of the alchemical substance and the Greek gods and all of that. <laughs> so I'll throw that out there for conversation. Oh, that would take us hours to really do. But um, <laughs> I can, I'd like to say a few things about it. Uh, I hope it would be helpful. Um, one is... Uh, that from an, uh, alchemy is, uh, I just this morning gave a lecture on alchemy, so it's on my mind. Alchemy is a, 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 a practice that was all around the world for centuries, where it was a parallel to astrology, where people have looked at physical things, like, you know, astrologers look at the, at the planets, and the, but they see meaning in the planets, and they see forms, and they see images, and that from those images, they, they, uh, it, it incites their imagination, and from that, they can offer suggestions for your future and how to live your life. It's a very, very interesting process. Alchemy is like that, except instead of using the stars, they use materials like stuff of the earth, like mud and stones and whatever it is you find in the earth or chemicals. And they put them into vessels and heat them up, put water in them, heat them up, and look at them closely. And they see these images, like they have visions. They have, it's hard to describe what that is. It's like looking at the clouds and you see animals, you know, in the clouds on a, on a cloudy day. And they see these things in the vessel. And they, they have to, Jung picked up on their writings what they saw in these vessels and thought that this was, what they were doing was depth psychology and a spiritual practice. And in fact, the alchemist had an oratory with him next to his oven and his, uh, his laboratory. And he would pray there because he knew he had to be guided. I think that's, all these things are, I think, are relevant. Um, the alchemists talked about water, and this would be parallel to alcohol. They said there's H2O, there's the water that we drink, and there's what they call, they use Latin all the time, aqua permanens, which means eternal water or timeless water. So they're talking about water that is not physical, but important and real. And they said, in alchemy, what we do is we put actual water into a vessel. What we're looking for is aqua permanence. 
the eternal water, the fluidity of life or the source of vitality, the water in us that gives us life, that keeps us alive, a kind of, you know, not a water you can look at and touch, but a water that exists in the imagination, eternal water. I think that alcohol is like that. There's alcohol that you drink and there's alcohol permanence. There's eternal alcohol. There's alcohol that speaks to the soul. I think that's the kind of alcohol that Jesus made at the miracle at Cana when he, when he turned water into wine. I, I don't think he was there to be a magician saying, look, I can make good wine. He was, there was a mystery there that I can change the world. I can change your life from being like plain water to being wine. That's the image for how your life will be if you stay, hang around with me. You'll no longer be like a glass of water. You'll be like a glass of wine. With all the intoxicating aspects of that and the intensity involved in it. So that's how I see it, that I think that in if dealing with, with the alcohol, the actual alcohol that's a problem for us, I think our main task might be to find the eternal alcohol that we're looking for. Some something, so I'll tell you, let me give you an example from my practice. I had a client years ago, a woman who came to me having great trouble with alcohol. And we talked about it at length, about many things. I think it was important to sort out what alcohol was for her. But one day she had a dream. She came to me. She was in a church. And she was in the baptistry of the church, standing in front of this place where people get baptized, like a stone platform. And as she was standing there, an angel came from the sky. And the angel was carrying a martini. And the angel put the martini on the altar, the baptismal altar there for her, and then went away. I thought that was not only one of the most important dreams for her, it said a lot for her, but I've kept that in my mind as about life itself and about our, how our addictions, that what, we're, what we need, we're suffering the alcohol like she was, what she really needed was the angel coming and offering a different kind of alcohol one that is not literal, but is in that realm of the spiritual and the imaginal. So, so that kind of comes back to that idea of spiritas contra spiritum. I have a problem with that, though. Can I say that, Patrick? Yeah, well, yeah. No, I, my problem is with the word contra. Okay. Good. Contra means against. I yeah. don't think spirit yeah. is against alcohol at all. I think the thing to do is to see how spirit and alcohol are brothers. You know, that they that they have a connection with each other, but it's not a connection of, of uh, you know, being against each other. I don't think that's what it is. I understand what you're saying that, they, I think what you're saying is that if you have a more spiritual, intensely spiritual life, it will counter the bad effects of the alcohol they're having. It's counter in that sense, contra. Right. But um, I wouldn't want to make too much of it because uh, I think spirit is very much in tune with the with that deeper kind of alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, the, whatever it is, if you want to know what that kind of alcohol is, just ask what it what you're looking for in it, what it gives to you. Mm -hmm. And and uh, get a sense of what that is in a not non-literal way. Yeah, or think of it not so much as a fermented or distilled drink, but think of it as what's the essence that we're talking about. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so again, the, the chat, I think we'll open the chat and allow people to come in with questions. I have a couple more things. Uh, Basically, um, in in terms of practicality, what can we do in order to to um, bring soul 
to become to have a deeper encounter with soul what are some practical you mentioned the home yes the nature. Well, there are so many so many things you can do you can you can do things that are very human see that the, the ancient teaching is the soul makes us human the spirit allows us to transcend our humanity but the soul makes us human it has to do with our humanity being human beings with ordinary human desires and fears and problems that's that's life what i've loved about the work of james hellman my friend and teacher in a way was uh that he could accept everything as part of the life of the soul that he didn't divide it up into the good and the bad so much uh, that everything has its place and that's pretty much the way it is with the soul so i think what we what we the way we could cultivate soul in particular is find those things that give us our humanity like let's say talking to our neighbors being able to get along with our neighbors that's why what's going on in the middle east today is soulless there's no soul there because the neighbors can't work it out neighbors can't work it out it's the same with russia and the ukraine neighbors can't work it out you know in the best of worlds neighbors can can really be benefit each other and you can have connections that just like you here you know being in your in your group here today your little community today your neighbors like look on the screen your neighbors to each other <laughs> we're neighbors on the screen so that is a sign of soul that's a sign of soul neighbors can talk to each other and listen to each other you can listen let the other person talk that's a fantastic achievement i wish our our politicians had learned that much listen to each other talk imagine getting started that way so that's soulful that's a soulful thing to do cultivating your friendships uh in history the most the, the most common theme among people interested in soul is friendship and they say that pleasure is important for the soul and the most important pleasure is the pleasure of your friends so there's a hint right there that a very good way to live a more soulful life is to take time to cultivate your friends and friendship and uh, give yourself to the French friendship and and I would say I go a little further that in all of our interactions we could be friendly make that friendly that's at soul too so uh, my family knows that when the uh, delivery people come to our house to deliver some mail or something I relate to them friendly as a friend I don't mean that now we're going to be friends forever we're going to be friends for a few minutes but that's what i'm looking for kind of this friend it's the greek said it's a special kind of love philia a particular kind of love that you give to your friends and that's a very important for the soul to have that feeling so that's a few things to get started but there's so much more wonderful now, I do know that you are acquainted with Irish culture, and um, we have this great thing in, in the 12-step rooms called sponsorship, and I'll show you how it all relates here in a minute. And the sponsor, the sponsor and the sponsee develop a, a relationship. In, in our pamphlet on sponsorship, it says that we meet as equals, and that the sponsor is somebody who's been around the program a while and understands it and helps the other person. And uh, there's various methods, and but it's laid out in, in the big book how to go about this pretty well. And, um, and like you said, it doesn't have to be like, obviously a therapist has a, you, you develop friendships, but th there's still, uh, there's still not, you know, it, they're not, it's not like a, a love relationship it's it's this thing that you're talking about this friendship and in ireland there's the anamkara the soul friend would you talk a little bit about that about this 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 way of of becoming friends like we do in the 12-step room sponsors sponsees therapist um patient or client i don't know the term <laughs> sure. That's, you, you yeah. can use a lot of terms yeah, yeah. I, I'll just first say first, I first went to Ireland when I was 19. 
1960. And uh, I lived there for two years. And uh, later, much later, my family, when I had a family, we spent a year and put our kids in school in Dublin. And now my daughter lives in Kerry, County Kerry. She's a musician. And um, so I have a very close connection to Ireland, north and south. And uh, I uh, I love it, you know, and I, I, I feel it. Dublin is my home, my home city. I know, I know it well, and my friends are there, and I feel very close to it. So when I speak of Ireland, it comes from my heart. Ireland is the kind of place that does get your heart into in motion, I think. Sometimes it can be ang anger, but most of the time it's pretty warm. And uh, so the Irish taught in an ancient, uh, ancient literature we have from Ireland. The Irish taught about this particular kind of friendship that is anamkara or soul friend. And it was it was discussed among the monks, uh, early monks. I mean, I'm I'm saying going back over a thousand years, you know, maybe fifteen hundred years. And uh, this kind of friendship was special because it was a friendship. It was definitely friend. That's why they called it friend. But at, it was a particular kind of friendship where the one person took care of the other in a way, like guided the other person, not in a heavy way, not telling them what to do and where to go and that kind of thing, but offering advice, uh, uh, showing some ex good example, and uh, talking, having conversations that had meaning. They weren't just superficial conversations, but had meaningful conversations especially in regard to uh, the other person's life. So it's a very interesting, uh, solid kind of friendship, the Anamkara. It's not just having a bunch of friends around. You know, it's not just that. It's something that has to do with guidance. So it's like halfway through to therapy almost. But it's not therapy. It's not therapeutic in a, in a strict sense. Uh, but it's a very important relationship where one person consciously and willingly takes cares for the welfare of the other. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And that that's kind of the way I see the, the sponsor, sponsee relationship, many similarities in AA. And of course, our kinship with others um on terms of, on the level of soul also extends to all beings and nature is that how you see it oh yes sure I mean, you open your heart to the world yeah. you open your heart to your world whether it's people or animals or uh, or the nature the natural world especially the natural world around you that's what Thoreau taught, you know, Henry David Thoreau taught that you mm -hmm. should just know nature in general. You should know the nature around you, where you live. You should get to know it and really know it. Of course, he really learned it. He, he really spent a good deal of time in studying the natural world around him. But we could all do it in our own way. And that be, that's kind of a befriending of nature, where we're not, we're not in, a, in an attitude of conflict or um, competition or control we're in those are three c's i guess that's that might work mm -hmm. and uh and uh we are instead we are in a relationship of friendship and in our psychology the one i do archetypal psychology we talk a lot about the soul of the world and uh hillman talked about the soul of everything everything that to realize that the world itself has a soul. It's not, it's not just, they're not just objects, the, the, you know, the things that are in nature. They're not objects. Don't treat them, they're subjects. They are, they are beings that have their own existence in their own way. And we have ours and we can have a relationship of friendship. We could have the Anamkara spirit going on in relation to nature. Yeah, Thoreau from Walden. That's not far from 
where is that Ma massachusetts i think not your part of the world but there's somebody else from that part of the world mary oliver yes poet. mary oliver was there there are a number of writers a lot of us in new hampshire yeah um, i'm only an hour and about hour and 20 minutes from walden so uh you know wow. we're pretty <laughs> you know and i was reading last night i was trying to come up with maybe a poem for you and uh, I found one here by Mary Oliver, who's one of my favorites. And uh, um, the, in this poem, let me find it. Oh, she well, some of the things she says to believe in the in the soul, to believe to believe in it exactly as much and as heartily as one believes in a mountain, say, or a fingernail, which is ever in view. Imagine the consequences, how far reaching, how thoroughly wonderful, for everything by such a belief would be charged and changed. You wake in the morning, the soul exists, your mouth sings it, your mind accepts it, and the perceived tactile world is upon that instance, only half the world. So we have these two worlds. Do you see it that way? As two worlds the soul or is it all one world how do you see well, I both i see both because there's a way in which the soul is who we are it's like the source of our existence and so it's inseparable from who we are the soul you know like isn't it true that when you you know live your life uh things come come up they rise in us all the time i uh desires you want to do things you never thought of before um, you get ideas for things. I know as a writer, I get ideas from somewhere in me. They're not me. I can't manufacture them, but they rise up in me. I can accept them or not. I can be aware of them and take them. Um, so uh, the relationship to soul as other is, is important, but at the same time, it is me. And you say the soul, the, the old philosopher said that the soul that is in that tree outside your house is in part the same soul that's in you. You are sharing that soul. It, it not, they're not separate. And on the other hand, we do have such a possession of our own soul that we call it ours, our soul. So it's a bit paradoxical. And I think it's okay to live with the, that paradox that maybe sometimes it feels that the soul is bigger than us. Jung once said that we, we exist in the soul. The soul does not exist in us. It's a famous mm. statement of his. Mm. And uh, so that's an interesting thought, you know, that we are in the soul rather than having the soul in us. On the other hand, I think both probably are right, that the soul is in us. Yeah. At the same time, we are in it too. Yeah, that's a, a paradoxical conundrum. <laughs> So I would like to go to the chat um, questions. We have um, somebody who's actually sitting in Ukraine and uh, regarding the Russia-Ukraine, how do you make friends with your neighbor when they're trying to kill you or Hitler during World War II? Uh, I, 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 pre I appreciate your positive sentiment, but I ask sincerely as someone who is sitting in Ukraine as we speak, having heard two air raid, raid sirens today and constant shelling, I completely support that the aggressor must be repelled and work towards that. So this is our dilemma that we face in so many parts of the world today. Yes, and it would be similar, similar in Israel when you say when the Israelis have been attacked and how can they do anything else but attack back? Well, it's true. I certainly we have to acknowledge these uh, the, these profound, deep, understandable uh, feelings. But there's also something in us, even if it's only a sliver, a small part of us, that can have a bigger vision. And maybe this is where it takes us back to our discussion about having a spiritual solution to our issues, to be able to have a a, a higher uh, vision that may be only small compared to the rage we have inside of us. But there, to some extent, if nothing else, to temper our, our reactions, 
our natural and immediate reactions to, to give them some quality that will allow ultimately this anamkara to, to be restored. It's impossible to see, I understand. And I know that if I were in that position, I would be the first to be full of rage and not see any, not want to have anything to do with this kind of a thing I'm talking about today. On the other hand, I know that I've been, I've dedicated my life to have a higher vision. And this is what an idea I could suggest to you that this higher vision, the spirituality we call it, is something you build in yourself. You build it, you create it. It doesn't happen naturally and it doesn't come in full, fully formed. You developed and, and when it is challenged in various ways, you, you try to keep it alive as much as you can. Keep alive your big vision, even your optimism. Try to keep that just a sliver, just a dose to have it available for you. And that's all you need. That, then that means there's some something there that keeps you a human being. And you know, we had all these wonderful things written from uh, people who were in prison under the Nazis, wonderful books, and uh, Elie Wiesel and people like that, Viktor Frankl, who told us the terrible, horrible situations they were in and how they worked to preserve their humanity, to keep their soul alive, at least to some extent. I think there's something there for all of us here today that, uh, that we can build on that spiritual point of view. We can keep it going, like keeping a flame going or keeping the structure being built. Uh, it's not automatic, it's not easy, it's not sentimental. It's, uh, it's something that it doesn't avoid life but it, uh, it understands our limitations, but it still, with all of that, keeps trying to build that spiritual edifice. Uh, uh, John John O'Donohue uh, O'Donohue I think they say don't they no, John O'Donohue uh, he said that uh, 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 he had you know when he presented that uh, that book Anamkara about the same time just a couple of years after I did Care of the Soul and um, we had a few times where we could talk about it together and um I didn't know him well, but we did have conversations. And um, I felt that I felt that he did a great service in resurrecting that idea of the Anamkara. Um, I'm, a, I'm a therapist, you know, and I, I deal most every day with really tough issues that people have. And um, so my idea of Anamkara might be a little, have a little more of an edge to it. Because, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this, I think that it's important, as any Jungian would say, to keep the shadow elements in mind. That, uh, so I think it's important to present our, our way of being friends and neighbors with a certain toughness. And I think that maybe some of the people here who are saying, don't be too glib and too positive about this because life is difficult and extremely challenging. They're reminding us that our idea of Anamkara has got to be a strong one. And that's why I wanted to tell you about building this idea of your spiritual existence to make it day after day and not just think it grows all by itself. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's full of challenges. And the world we live in is a materialistic world. It's a world that doesn't recognize images and the poetic and metaphor around us. It doesn't, uh, that's too soft. 
we see everything practically and what can be measured, what we can control. It's a particular world. It's a modern world that has great limitations. And I think if you want to deal with any challenges that you have, one of the best things you could do would be to explore a different kind of world, another dimension, where you can see there's a lot of meaning behind things. That, uh, and that our spiritual life, our vision, our great vision, maybe even our optimism, is something that we build to extend the world in which we live, to make it richer and more human. It has been such a long time. I did many years ago. It's been a while. Recently, what I read in preparation to talk to you were, uh, were um, uh, accounts of the relationship between Bill Wilson and uh, Carl Jung. Uh, I, was, I was quite interested in those letters that they exchanged and to see what, the, you know, what was going on there because um, I feel that... Uh, you know, it is, it's, it, it's, see, it's important to have, I can't tell you how much I have studied and read in my life to, to develop, to create, to build in myself uh, the depth and the height, the spiritual and the soul elements, uh, study of mythology and religions and all of this to be able to have a big enough vision to be able to see what's going on in something like a challenge with alcohol. Um, that has, I have to admit, that has been my focus all the time. And I haven't read other things that are more related to, you know, related to life as you're doing it. I'm, 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 I kind of float in my world, I will confess that. Of course, I have my own life and I have my own experience of my clients and therapy, which I say are very grounding. So um, what I wanted to be able to bring to you is something fresh, I had hoped, something somewhat different. I didn't want to be too academic about it because I can, I can go off on those, those tangents. Um, I'd love to talk to you about the guy Dionysus. And I'd love to talk to you about more about the story of Jesus and also about the Sufis, the great Sufi poets who write about being intoxicated with the divine. And so there are all these images of intoxication. And even the book I have of Sufi poets is called The Drunken Universe. And I would not, I'd like to be able to talk to you about those things because they expand our notion of uh, what we're dealing with. And I think it's our problem usually is that we're too influenced by the world around us to have narrow ideas of how to solve problems. We have to focus more on what is happening in our lives and having great images and great resources that are much bigger that can help us. So that's where, see, when you talk about spirit, helping with spirits, uh, to me, the way that helps is that we get a much greater vision of what's going on. We know better, might, we might be able to know better what is happening, like what is it we're really looking for? Like what was my client looking for? The dream told her she was looking for what the angel could give her, not what the drink could give her. To me, that's a very important lesson. And that's what I do, I kind of represent the angel coming in, floating in saying, there's a different kind of alcohol, go look for it, get that. I find that in many, many, many symptoms that people have. We say in my psychology, in archetypal psychology, we say always, go into the symptom, don't go against it. Go into the symptom, get what the symptom is trying to show you, no matter what it is. So if your symptom is loneliness, go into the loneliness, don't just try to be among a lot of people thinking you're going to help it, go into the loneliness. Go into the symptom 
And in that same spirit, I would say, go into the alcohol. Not literally, but get a sense of what it is, like the dream show, that's something else. It's something at a much higher level that maybe you haven't considered, something that you could maybe bring into your life. I do feel that, um, again, as a therapist, I feel that it can be very, very worthwhile to keep telling the stories of your childhood and your feelings, especially today, about what happened with you in your childhood. You don't want to, you don't want to make, make it, uh, like it's an obsession, I don't mean that. But it's good to go over those things and maybe as an adult, the older you get, to be able to notice things about those stories, to appreciate them differently, like maybe to have some understanding for your mother that you never had before. Or as a therapist, I'll ask about the mother's own experience, maybe as much as that person knows, what was your mother's life like? to extend it, to get the story richer and more complex. And that's appropriate as an adult. When you're very young, you, maybe you can't deal with that complexity, but as you get older, you can. So I think there are things we can do, and it's very important to deal with those very difficult uh, childhood experiences, to do something with them, so that we're not just repeating that story over and over again feeling the victim of it constantly. That doesn't take us anywhere. We have to go, go somewhere. We have to move somewhere in the storytelling. S telling stories and listening to stories is the essence of what therapy is. And you can do that as friends. And I think that was probably what was being suggested here of calling the, talking about Anamkara in your relationships. That, the, that friendship doesn't have to be just being a buddy and having a good time together. It can be one person helping the other person clarify what they've been through. And uh, not telling them what to do, that's a whole different thing, but helping that person by being listening closely and maybe giving them some feedback. Uh, that can be a most precious thing. And I think that's one of the messages that I'm feeling here being with you today, how important that your association with each other is, your, uh, your being able to be together, to have some things in common and talk to each other, not the way people talk to each other usually today, superficially, but talk about things that matter, such a difference. I think that uh, trauma uh, is as uh, trauma is not to be taken. I'm going to sound like I'm repeating myself here, but trauma does not have to be always taken as just a memory. But it's a story we tell of our experience, and we tell it often. And it helps us to explain who we are sometimes because we, we think that trauma has made us, we tell the story that the trauma has made us feeling what we're feeling today. We're looking for explanations, looking for some way to make sense of what has gone on in our past, especially if it's been traumatic. 
another way of look at it, looking at it is that the trauma story is the story we tell today about who we are today. And uh, I think if we could, it's funny, just be adults, be a more grown person than we were then when that trauma happened and respond to it, that we might have a, a more insight and we might be stronger in relation to it and don't have to feel victim to it. An awful lot of, I think, what we're talking about here has to do with um, having, having your own power and not being the victim. I think it's important, very important aspect of this whole thing to have your power. And I'm interested in what I might call, it sounds a little like too much, but what I would call soul power as opposed to force, personal force a deep power that comes up from within you when you are in touch with your depths and with the things that are, you know, your real capacities, your real abilities and your deep intelligence and trusting yourself to have some intelligence and strength. I think that is very, very important uh, part of this whole picture that we're talking about here. In trauma, we have been usually victimized. And it's very easy to remain in that place. And so we have to get back. But if, if you just get back to have sort of a reactive force to what's happened, that doesn't get you anywhere because you're still in that same old narrative. What we need is a new one where you have power, a deep power, where you're not just having to get even with people or get, it, get even the score anywhere. That doesn't do anything but where you find your own power and that you're not going to let this trauma destroy your life. And, and where you have the power to build your, your own existence and tell your own story the way you want to tell it. That takes time, I know, but I think it has a lot to do with potency, with power that's within you. And you can catch yourself when you're losing your power and feeling victimized by somebody else. And try to get out of that place. Trauma is a story in a way. It's something that has happened that has become a story in your life. And it has worked in a certain way in your life and probably not for the best. So let's see if we can explore this story and shift it where we have some more power, a deep, deep power from who we are, from our very identity. I think that would be a good move. Good, thank you. That's, that's thank you. That, that, that adds a lot to what I just said. something of great importance to me. Faith is very important. Um, but I don't mean by faith, I don't mean just believing in something. I mean more trust, a deep trust, and not just a feeling of trust, but actually a way of being in the world with trust. Um, this might open me up to a similar uh, objection as before, that the world is not trustworthy. But at the same time, it seems to me that we have to, we have to develop trust in a more absolute sense. I like your idea of a two-way prayer that makes sense to me. Uh, we have to listen for guidance. Uh, it doesn't, guidance just come out, it doesn't come out of our head. It, uh, and there's an otherness about experience. You, don't, I mean, you can describe it any way you want. You can say an angel comes to you, or I can say a muse helps me write my books. Uh, we can say conscience guides us when we're trying to decide what to do and not to do. Uh, there's an otherness about our existence. The great psychologist Rollo May talked a lot about this, about uh, how we, there's an other 
voice and presence, the daimon, they called it, that's in us that can, can help us get along, but it has to be other. It can't be just out of ourselves. And I can see a two-way prayer that way. Um, and uh, the faith then comes from partly trusting, uh, generally trusted, but trust, you got it. Here's the point about trust and faith. It, it's, it can't be childish. It can't be open-ended without any, any uh, limits on it. It has to be faith that where you can use your intelligence to say, is this the proper time for me to really be trusting? And how, tr how do I trust? Do I trust naively that people are going to take care of me no matter what? You can't trust that from anybody. People are not totally dependable. And if you think that way, your trust in your faith is too naive and too childish. We're back to a question that has come up in our conversation. Very interesting one to me today that so much of our thinking as adults comes from our childhood and hasn't grown up. So our faith has to grow up. It has to be an adult, adult faith, a faith that comes from an adult who can think and has intelligence make judgments, discern. If you can do that and still have trust, that's pretty good. But if you go around with a kind of faith that is, sounds like a child talking, uh, you're in trouble. I'm afraid that's where a lot of people are. Yes, I, I think I, I think several things you said really, really struck me and touched me. Uh, one is that uh, al the alcohol can take you away from yourself, where you're not living your life and you're not in touch with yourself. And one thing AA can help you with, like a gathering like today, is mm -hmm. to uh, discover you, that you have a life, that, yeah. that, that who you are is significant and important, and that other people will listen to you. But I can tell you they are essential for us. And when they're not there, we go a little crazy. Mm. And I think our addictions are like that. We kind of go looking for something to be attached to. I've always felt that addiction is a kind of love. You know, that it's a way of loving. It's an odd way of putting it, but not, not great love, but it's still love. Mm. Love of something, being attached to something, wanting to be around something. It sounds like love to me. Yeah. And uh, what we need is a kind of, is a deepening and making that love more adult. I keep saying that because a lot of these experiences and addictions that we have are come from a childish place. And we have to be adults. It sounds to me the way you're talking now that you discovered your adulthood. And you don't let, you don't give so much to other people's opinions because mm. you're who you are and you're valuable and your opinions are very important, the most important. And you can trust them. We get back to faith. You can trust them. You can trust yourself. So that, you know, the, the, uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood that's here, the uh, being able to tell your story openly and honestly, to be yourself. Mm. Uh, these, are, these are the basics of life. And uh, this is what you find can be curing for you, can be helpful and uh, take you to a better place. They're very basic, but they're more important than they look. why the, the, the work of a therapist is, is not an easy one. And it takes a lot of courage and some guts to do it. And to realize that, you know, to, to be in touch with your own strength, uh, you could, you, I think you best give hope to your client 
by having it yourself. You don't have to talk about hope with them because that can easily become overblown and sentimental. You don't want that. You want, you want to be realistic and at the same time have some optimism. I often talk, as you notice maybe, about dosages. You have a little dose of hope. You don't need you know, a big sheet of hope falling, falling over everything. Just a little dose that comes in. And I think if you have it, if you can look at your client and see for all the things that they've been through, my, in my experience, there's always some basis for hope. It may be very small. And I don't even bring it up always. What I often do is just have it myself. I feel that it's contagious. I feel that if I have it, the person sees it in me, they will be able to gradually bring it over to themselves. So a lot has to do with yourself. And you know, I, I, if, you, if you were to read Jung's books on therapy, he, he wrote a couple uh, really beautiful essays on therapy. He says this over and over again. The therapist has to deal with it himself or herself. The therapist has to deal with it. Don't, don't put it on the shoulders of your client. And most of the problems in therapy come up because the therapist can't handle it. So he says that so many times. And he says also that the therapist is the most unconscious person of all because they think they're so smart. So I think these are things worth keeping in mind that you have to do the work. You have the struggle to find your way to hope, hope with this person. You have to find it honestly within yourself to see the hope that's there. If you don't see it, nothing you do with your clients is going to matter much. You have to go, you know, go on that journey to find it and, and face the obstacles that come along. It's too easy to sit back and analyze your, your client. That's one thing. And as far as the stories of multiple traumas go, I think it's the multiplicity makes it more, more difficult and more complicated, but it's the same situation. It's so important for that person to be able to tell their story openly and honestly, knowing that they have someone who will listen to it without being uh, shocked or uh, fall into some sort of interpretation or try to give them advice, but listen and let them know they're being heard. Uh, and maybe give them, if they're gonna give them many feedback, some really heartfelt, deep, wise response. But no, none of this psychobabble or therapist talk, you know, just really respond to the person briefly and uh, let them talk. But your job is mainly to listen and to let people know you're hearing what they're saying. And maybe, as Carl Rogers used to teach, I'm still very much attached to Carl Rogers, who says you, you listen with positive regard for your client and you feed back what you have heard. Don't give them more than what you've heard, but you may have heard things that they have not, that they don't know they're saying. To me, that's the real, that's the real crux of it. Can you feed back to your client things that you heard that they haven't heard? that they don't know. And that's your skill and that's your training. That's what, that's what it's all about. But it's primarily being in a dialogue, listening well, and not just hearing, but listening, really taking it in and hear, listening in such a way that you, you get a sense of what's going on. You can feed back a little more in that sense. You amplify what they're saying, bring it up a little bit. And I would say too, with trauma, one more thing, I always rely on the dreams. A person's dreams, you don't have to be a great dream interpreter, just think poetically with some metaphor. Don't be literal about it, but listen to the dream and see if there's some, some dynamics there that help you see what the person is going through. I'll give you an example. I had a guy who was in quite a traumatic situation and he presented me with a dream in which a dog was following him as he was walking down a lane. And he turned around and saw the dog and hit the dog with a club and started beating the dog for no reason. 
And that dream, I think, told us a lot about what was going on with this guy and why he was so feeling so upset. He was there to, to club whatever came along. He wouldn't stop and see who's there and what's going on and take care of the dog. He had to, he had to beat it. So there was something in him that wanted to beat. And that helped us, it, you know, helped us see more deeply what this person was actually going through with his trauma. So I would not be overwhelmed by the trauma, not uh, be astonished or uh, you as a, a therapist has to be big enough to hold a lot of tough material, very difficult things. I used to ask therapists in training, what's your limit? What can't you handle? And I tell them, get to the point where you can handle at least almost anything, because that's your job. You have to be able to take what people give you and don't be, don't be this, you know, don't be too tender. Take it on, hold it, and help them by being able to receive what they are giving you. So with multiple trauma, that's what I would say would be, uh, it's a challenge to the therapist primarily. Wonderful. Um, that's, you know, Thomas, we're so, so honored to have you here. So grateful to have you here, truly. This was just wonderful. And uh, I know that you've got, uh, your wife has got the list of chores ready for you. Yes. <laughs> and so we'll we'll end it. And typically we end it with a little prayer or a, a little thought, you know. Excellent. Um, we do the typically the serenity prayer or, or something else. Is there anything, the way that some little thought you'd like to end with? Uh, well, how about, would it be all right if I just uh, let some words come from me? I don't know what they are, but. Absolutely. A little Quaker style. Sure. How important it is for us to gather together. There is something bigger than us all when we are gathered together. And that thing that is bigger that we have invited in and welcomed is the thing that will help us get along. And being together reminds us that we're all human beings, we're all in the same boat. We're all plan B, we're all trying to get along. Nobody's perfect. And the recognition of that is a way of discovering how valuable we are.